Last week, former Customs and Border Patrol agent and serial killer Juan David Ortiz was found guilty of murdering four women in Laredo, Texas in the fall of 2018. He thought of himself as a vigilante who was, quote, cleaning up the streets. But his crimes were just part of a larger pattern of crimes and abuses by an agency known by locals as the Green Monster. Let's get into it. Hi folks, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for spending time with me. If you're new here, I'm Delaney, a true crime writer and all around murder nerd. On this channel, I like to cover some of the worst cases and I tend to cuss a lot. So if you're into that sort of thing, go ahead and subscribe. If not, that's cool, you do you. So now let's get back into the case of Juan David Ortiz. On September 4th, 2018, a rancher found the body of a woman beside a dirt road north of Laredo, Texas. She was lying face down, still holding a bag of M&Ms. She'd been shot multiple times in the head and once in the wrist with a 40 caliber pistol, execution style. She would later be identified as Melissa Ramirez, a 29-year-old sex worker and mother of two young children. Even though Laredo is a border town, it's the largest U.S.-Mexico border crossing and the largest port in the country, it's relatively safe. So investigators were able to make her murder a priority. They had a network of surveillance cameras along most of the rural roads in that area in order to catch illegal border crossers. But this road was one of the few that wasn't covered. So they tried pulling footage from nearby cameras to run the license plates of any vehicles that might have been in the area at the time of the killing. That task was given to the South Texas Intelligence Center, which is run by Customs and Border Patrol. The only vehicle they said they found belonged to a police officer who was able to be cleared. Investigators were able to come up with a few names, which they passed on to the Intelligence Center, but none of those leads seemed to pan out. Ten days later, along a dirt road not two miles away, another woman was found with a 40 caliber gunshot wound to the head. This woman was still alive, but just barely. Her name was Claudine Luera, and she was also a sex worker and a mother of five. Sadly, she succumbed to her wounds and died at the hospital. Ballistics tests would later show that the shots were fired from the same gun as the one used on Ramirez. The next night after Luera was found, Friday, September 14th, Erica Pena, terrified and topless, flagged down a state trooper at a gas station. Pena, who was also a sex worker, told the cop she'd just narrowly escaped from a man who'd pointed a pistol at her head and told her he was going to kill her. The thing was, she knew the man, at least somewhat. She only knew him as David, but he'd been a regular customer of hers and the other sex workers who hung out along San Bernardo Avenue in Laredo. They all knew him to be friendly and normal. He'd often just want to drive around and talk, and he'd give them rides if they needed it. So when David had pulled up in his white Dodge Ram that night, Pena had no qualms about hopping in with him. David was actually Customs and Border Patrol agent Juan David Ortiz. Ortiz had grown up in Brownsville, Texas, then joined the Navy just a month after his 18th birthday. He served for eight years, including a tour of duty in Iraq, and eventually earned the rank of second class hospital corpsman. As far as I could tell, he didn't have any disciplinary issues there. Friends who served with him said he was such a straight arrow, he rarely even cussed. Like a lot of vets, he decided to go into law enforcement right after getting out of the military. The San Antonio PD had accepted his application and reserved him a spot in their academy, but he had turned them down to go to work for Customs and Border Patrol, which had offered him higher pay and some other incentives. So he officially joined the Border Patrol in August 2009, first in the little town of Cotula, yes, that's how it's pronounced, and then Laredo. He rose through the ranks to the position of intelligence supervisor, while also earning a master's degree through St. Mary's University in San Antonio. Along the way, he married his high school sweetheart and had two children. He and his wife bought a house in a newly built suburb where his neighbors described him as quiet and he kept to himself. Where have we heard that before? The family attended church regularly. 
One of his former military buddies would later say that Ortiz seemed to genuinely care about the migrants crossing the border and that he wanted to use his medical skills to help the ones who'd been traveling for days in the desert. The only disciplinary mark he had on his record was one allegation by a migrant that he'd stolen a cigarette from him. After an internal investigation, the complaint was dropped. In September 2018, he had been going to work like normal and was actually part of the intelligence center team that had been assigned to investigate the earlier killings. So when Ortiz had picked her up and taken her to his house on September 14th, Peña felt comfortable enough to talk to him about her friend, Melissa Ramirez, who had been killed only days earlier. But she said his reaction made her feel really uneasy. She said he told her he'd been the next to the last person to have sex with Ramirez and was worried investigators would find his DNA on her body. She said, it made me think that he was the one who might have been murdering. So she asked him to take her to a gas station so she could get something to eat, thinking she could just bolt once they got there. But as they continued talking during the drive, he must have sensed that she suspected something because he changed completely. He pulled a gun on her. When she tried to jump out of his truck, he grabbed her shirt. She managed to slip out of it and escape, then ran to the cop who'd been filling up his patrol car at that same gas station. She was able to describe David and his truck and even take them to his house. So police put out a bolo for the man who they now believed might be responsible for the murders of Ramirez and Luera. But their killer was only getting started. Immediately after Pena escaped from him, he went back home and stocked up on ammo. He drove back to San Bernardo Avenue and picked up 35-year-old Giselda Hernandez Cantu and drove her to an overpass on I-35 near where the others had been found. He told her to get out of the truck, then shot her twice in the neck before cracking her over the head with a blunt object, probably the butt of his gun. Her body was found not long afterwards while the police were still looking for him. Anyway, Ortiz then went back and picked up yet another sex worker, a 28-year-old transgender woman named Janelle Enriquez Ortiz, no relation, and took her five miles from the site of the earlier killings behind some gravel pits and shot her once in the back of the head. He was headed back again to San Bernardo, but stopped at a gas station to use the bathroom. That's where police found him and tried to arrest him, even using a taser on him, but he was able to flee the scene on foot. He ran to a parking garage at a Ramada Inn where he hid in the bed of a pickup truck. While he was hiding, he made two Facebook posts. To my wife and kids, I love you, and Doc Ortiz checks out, farewell. When he was surrounded by police, he waved around his phone and attempted a swear by a cop, but he was arrested. In his pickup truck, investigators found a 40 caliber handgun. Ballistics tests would show it was a match for the murder weapon in all four killings. At first, he was reluctant to talk, but after investigators pressured him to do the right thing, he confessed. Not only had he killed the three women they knew about, Ramirez, Luera, and Cantu, he told police about the other woman he'd killed just that night, Enrique's Ortiz, and even offered to lead them to her body. His confession makes him sound a lot like Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. Ortiz admitted to investigators that he'd been a customer of most of the women, but at the same time, he also expressed his disgust for sex workers, referring to them as trash and dirty. He said he wanted to, quote, clean up the streets and eradicate all prostitutes. Ortiz told investigators how he picked up Ramirez on September 3rd, then drove about 30 miles out of town to a spot he knew was not covered by surveillance cameras. He said she'd gotten out of his truck to pee, and that's when he shot her. He told them about picking up Luera 10 days later. Apparently, she had told him that she knew he was the last person to see Ramirez alive. So when she got out of his truck, he shot her too. He even described how when he had aimed his gun at Kentu, she had begged him not to shoot, and told him, put your life in God's hands. God will take care of you. He said he looked right at her and pulled the trigger. 
He was charged with four counts of murder and one count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He was later indicted on one count of capital murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, unlawful restraint, and evading arrest. Ortiz's arrest was yet more bad news for the Border Patrol. In the Laredo sector alone, he had been the fourth agent arrested that year, along with an agent who allegedly murdered his girlfriend and one-year-old child, another who allegedly essayed a woman after threatening to deport her, and another one who was never named who shot and killed an unarmed Guatemalan woman at the border. According to Gus Bova with the Texas Observer, Customs and Border Patrol, the nation's largest law enforcement agency, has long been infested with violence and corruption. From 2005 to 2012, Border Patrol agents were arrested over 2,100 times for misconduct like domestic violence and drug driving. Customs and Border Patrol was also the target of nearly 1,200 complaints of excessive force from 2007 to 2012. And a 2013 government report found that Border Patrol agents regularly stopped in the paths of cars in order to justify firing at the drivers, as well as shooting at people throwing rocks, including teenagers on the Mexican side of the border with the intent to kill. Former Customs and Border Patrol officials also accused the agency of acting more like the military than a civil police force and of abusing its extra constitutional powers that they have within 100 miles from any border. And from 2004 to 2018, more than 200 agents were arrested on corruption-related charges. All of this had earned the Customs and Border Patrol a reputation as the Green Monster. According to public statements from former high-level employees, all this can be traced back to the massive growth in the years after 9-11. During his second term, George W. Bush doubled the size of Border Patrol. In a court filing, two ex-officials who led the agency's Office of Internal Affairs wrote that inadequate screening had led the agency to hire actual cartel members. Then, during the Trump administration, he ordered the agency to add 5,000 more Border Patrol agents as soon as possible. So the agency streamlined its hiring process even more, including by reducing polygraph requirements. Not that it would have made any difference in this case. Ortiz had no criminal record or any other red flags. Anyway, Ortiz pled not guilty to all charges. At his trial in December 2022, his defense argued that he was improperly induced to make the confession, so it should be thrown out. The defense also argued that Ortiz was suffering from PTSD, insomnia, nightmares, and headaches, and that he had been medicated and drunk that night, the night of the 14th, or all three nights that he murdered these women. It's not clear. Prosecutors said that it was a legal confession provided by an educated senior law enforcement official who was not having a mental breakdown. The jury deliberated for four and a half hours before finding him guilty of capital murder. Because the prosecuting attorney had declined to pursue the death penalty, his automatic sentence will be life in prison without parole. As for Customs and Border Patrol, thanks to the work of several human rights organizations, the agency recently announced that they would triple the staff of their Office of Professional Responsibility, which investigates allegations of abuse and corruption. In addition, they announced that they'll be disbanding their Border Patrol critical incident teams, which have been implicated in some of the worst abuses, including witness intimidation, destruction of evidence, and covering up murders but without real independent oversight with teeth, I'm not confident it'll make much difference. So what do you think about this case? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, go ahead and click the button and consider subscribing to my channel. You can also support me on Patreon. Not only will you be helping me create more nerdy content, you'll get early access to videos, free merch, and you can request the cases for me to cover. The link is in the description. And just FYI, I'm going to take a break over the holidays, so the next video won't be out until mid-January. Till next year, darklings.